out of hard times also comes opportunity. Hello and welcome to the Property Voice podcast with me, your host, yeah, you might have realised it's not Richard Brown. Today it's Helen Pollock, the content doc. And there's a very good reason why Richard isn't interviewing today. That's because he's our guest. There's nobody better to talk about working full time in property than Richard. So some of you may know um, a bit about Richard's background and how he came to be working in property full time. Some of you may not, but I know that Richard's got so many valuable experiences to share. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest today, Richard Brown, the property voice. Hello, Richard. Hi, Helen. How, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How does it feel to be on the other side today? Weird. <laughs> it, feels, <laughs> it feels weird, but it's great that you're doing it, so I feel a lot more comfortable. Thank you so much for agreeing to quiz me on my own show. But anyway, it's great. Thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. And uh, as I said, I know that you've got so much to share that listeners will find really valuable. So let's uh, let's crack on and I'll, I'll start quizzing you so first of all some of your listeners might not know what your background is so before you started uh, going into property what were you doing what was i doing yeah it's always do you know what every time i ask a guest that question they like what do you want to tell me should i say when i was born and where and you know all that stuff and i was like yeah i guess it you know i ought to be a bit more specific but some of it can be quite relevant um, so I did come from, I, I like to say I came from a working class family. Um, I think my dad would say he's aspiring middle class. Um, and, you know, so whilst, you know, he had, had a news agency, for example, and he ran an insurance uh, area book. And my, my mom was uh, a legal secretary and then, and then retired with a bit of RSI. So um, that was the sort of upbringing, if you like. And the relevance of that is, that I guess I was taught hard work from a very early age because for example in the news agents being the eldest son i basically i had two paper rounds and sometimes three obviously when somebody didn't show up so um i guess i had a bit of a work ethic from an early stage which was you know a small business you know obviously a news agency um if you can call it that and then you know the real you know grind of it of of doing the newspaper round so that was that and that kind of that theme carried on so every time through school and college and university you know mainly college and university i always had jobs part-time jobs summer jobs you know, christmas jobs jobs and so uh, you know work ethic is very much drilled into me from from that stage and money wasn't you know a, a, a wash let's say from from those years and so you know that was another thing that you know there was a bit of scarcity i suppose that you know that i learned Needless to say, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to university and have, you know, my education paid for by the government, which I was privileged, of course, to be in that, like, that place. Now, it's not quite the same these days, of course, um, by any means, is it? But um, okay. I had the opportunity of getting a, a decent education uh, and I really took that. And um, I went into, I, I trained, I started training in accountancy after leaving university. So seemed to be quite good at numbers that my best a level was accounting and i got an a in accounting but by the way i reckon um i should have taken accounting aardvarkism and something else beginning with a because <laughs> i also took economics but i got an e in economics at, in a level so uh, i don't know what happened there but um that just put it down to a bad day but yeah i was always pretty interested in numbers and always pretty interested in people um, so as the accountancy, if you like, uh, gave a, a good background in both, but um, probably more so the numbers than the people. <laughs> and so actually I made a switch over into leasing and asset finance, which is um, financial services. And I was working for um, a subsidiary of HSBC Bank, as is now, um, back then. And um, I think I found my environment, professionally speaking, at that point. Um, it was really good. There was a lot of numbers and a lot of people. So, you know, that, that kind of worked. Um, Made, made my way up, if you like. That was the first part of my career, financial services, really. And um, 
So the relevance of that, of course, is I had a decent financial, you know, background. I could read a balance sheet. Uh, I, you know, I could talk about things like discounted cash flow, and um, you know, all of that good stuff. In fact, I wrote white paper. That was a bit of a clue, actually, because writing um, was something I kind of wanted to do from an early age, but didn't really do anything about it for quite a long time. But hold that thought. So yeah, um, Lisa and Asset Finance, Financial Services. The irony is I was, I was in business to business financial services, as I mentioned, but my personal finances, I'll be very honest with you, were absolutely shocking. They were, they were I was not clever. Um, I, I kind of rolled the dice a bit, let's say that. Um, my pension wasn't in a great shape and I put it into the wrong place, wrong type of investment. Um, despite having my um, tuition fees paid for at university, I left university with a lot of student debt uh, from living expenses, perhaps over living expenses. Um, so I carried a bit of debt from actually more than a decade um, from, from the student years. And, you know, just a few things that probably didn't make the wisest decision. So I had this contrast in on my professional career. I was, I kind of knew how it went and I was giving advice almost, you know, how to, you know, work with numbers and money and stuff. But personally, I was a mess, really. I didn't, and, and I think I'm being very honest about it here because it's not the same today, uh, fortunately. And so I can, I can shame myself, my former self, because I managed to sort that out. Um, but back then, of course, being uh, in financial services, you couldn't, you couldn't say, I don't know anything about money, you had to pretend you did. And, um, and I think, you know, maybe some people can resonate with that. But needless to say, um, just to kind of finish the pre-property bit, um, I kind of, I went into, um, I had a meandering path. I, I managed to step out of full-time employment once um, and then went contracting. So I was a contractor for a while and the intention was to start my own business. And I migrated to run a couple of companies. I did okay. So I had what I call it my real life MBA by running a couple of businesses but in industries I didn't really know that much about when I started. One was a call center, one was a technology business. Then it was a security, uh, online security business or e-commerce business. So I kind of taught myself several industries from the inside. And that was quite good as well because you learn about business, you know, and obviously running a business, all the different disciplines. Sold those, didn't make a fortune, but did okay. Um, and then tried to be a consultant um, with mixed results, I think, in all honesty. I think I remember seeing, I was trying to advise a small business owners at the time. And I, I remember seeing probably between 70 and 100 small business owners. And I would say this is the experience I had there is that probably only one in 10 were really making it. I think um, a vast majority were just getting by and some were probably on the verge of collapse. So that was a bit of an eye opener to watch that. And I only just got by when I was a small business person myself. So um, I, have a, you know, I, I can resonate a lot with people who have that struggle. Needless to say, I probably, it was feast and famine, the whole project side of things of consulting, uh, feast and famine. And eventually I decided that it would probably be better to go back into full-time employment. And so a crazy man by the name of John Chitty um, at Oracle uh, took me back, you know, probably I was unemployable already by then, but um, <laughs> he took me back uh, into the leasing and asset finance industry, you know, financing software and things like that. And I did a couple of years with him. Um, I don't think he regretted the decision, but I didn't stay that long. I went to work for other companies like Microsoft and Siemens on the financial services side of things. Before, um, well, I had one bad experience, but I don't know if you want to talk about that, what led me into property, but that was the pre-property preamble, which is probably quite a long, uh, longer than you imagined a story, actually. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and really interesting to hear about that disconnect between your business life, where you, you know, you're great with finance and you know, your personal life where the finances weren't quite so uh looking so great um, and also the um the consultancy that's so interesting that you estimate that around one in only one in ten of the small businesses where you carried out consultancy work were actually making it um, i think um many of us think that uh, a job or um a small business where we're the boss 
are going to be the answer financially. And I think, you know, what you've just demonstrated is that's not the case, actually. So that which, yeah. No, I was just going to say, I mean, certainly can be the case, but I think the statistics, you know, can be misleading. I'm not, if you've probably read uh, Millionaire Fastlane, for example, or books of that ilk, you, you know, we talk, you know, about the only way to get rich really is for having your own company, having your own business. And I'd, I'd probably a large, I wouldn't largely agree with it, but that's certainly true. There's truth in that. But at the same time that, you know, there's a survivor bias. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of businesses that don't make it, uh, or if they do, they, they struggle along and bounce along the bottom. So that's the reality. So it's not, what is it quote I heard the other day? Some people will work 80 hours a week for themselves so they don't have to work 40 hours a week for someone else. <laughs> so. I, I suspect many of our listeners can relate to that one. <laughs> so um, moving on from that, Point that you talked us through your um, your history, your education, and your early working life. How did you come to start investing in property? Yeah. Um, so apart from, I, I really I was an accidental landlord in the mid nineties, and I didn't know what I was doing, Helen. In all honesty, back then, um, I, I got a I got a job with a relocation, and so I was living in 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 Slough. Yeah. I was living in Slough and I got a job in Manchester. And so um, I went up to Manchester and I just thought, well, just rent the place out. I don't know why. I just thought rent the place out. And um, I got an agent because I was in Manchester and got some tenants who said they want to stay there forever, um, more or less. And within six months, probably less than six months, actually, within the first few months, there was a major sort of repair. There was a, a water tank which exploded somehow. Um, oh caused quite a lot of damage and the you know so that that wiped out at least a year's worth of rental profit to fix that and the other thing and it was quite stressful because I was away and I didn't really know anything of what I was doing and the other thing is the tenants who are going to stay forever decided to move on so foolishly actually in retrospect in hindsight I decided to sell that property so I made some money out of it from a capital gain point of view but do you know what I you know I used to go and look at the value but I stopped doing that a few years ago because yeah it would, uh, it would cause pain so that was a that was a regret if you like to sell that property but fast forward to the mid noughties so mm -hmm. this wasn't that long ago really so roughly 15 years ago um I kind of I was <laughs> I was working probably with my friend John I just talked about maybe I'm not sure the exact timing but I went for a sneaky pint after work one summer's evening and I was in the beer garden uh, and I was just, I was on my own <laughs> and I was doodling uh, on a napkin with a pen. Um, and you're going to think this is bizarre, but I was doodling compound interest and, and portfolio growth uh, on this napkin uh, because I understood the concept in a business to business sense. And I was kind of starting to think of it in a personal sense with property. And I, I call it my eureka moment because um, it was, it's like, oh, wow, uh, I, this is it, you know, what have I been doing all my life, you know, I didn't understand this. And I was even working in a sector where you do, you know, work with those numbers. So uh, needless to say, I took a decision that I was going to get into property uh, from that experience. But it actually took another four years before I finally did get into property. And ironically, that four year delay cost me probably about two million pounds in gross property value. Wow. Yeah. Um, probably excluding capital growth. It may include some rental profit, but around about two million pounds that four year delay cost me. And that was effectively the, 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 the what I did in the first year, you know, multiplied by the four years I'd missed out. That's what happened. And, and here's the thing. I thought I needed a load of money to get going. And that's the main reason why I waited. I also wanted to get educated. Uh, it took a bit too long getting educated. And ironically, when, by the time I got educated, I realized I didn't need as much money as I thought I did. So I was like, oh, gosh. So, but that was a catalyst, really, because that really um, started me wanting to share my knowledge in property as well, because there was a mess around that time. I don't know if, if you were looking at property around about the mid noughties, but it was like the wild west. 
you know, it was like the Wild West in terms of values and people doing, you know, same day remortgaging and assignable off plan deals and 125% loans and all of that stuff. And then loads of bad advice and actually downright illegal advice as well. Mm -hmm. So I kind of decided, uh, well, part of the reason it took me so long to learn is I had to wade my way through all that stuff. Meanwhile, the, the property crash arrived, didn't it? So my, my first investment actually coincided with the property crash. Fortunately, I guess I was on the right side of it rather than the wrong side of it. So I bought my first property proper, as I like to say, in about 2000, it was 2009, first few properties in 2009. And so they were effectively, um, I always tried to add value to property. That's something I recognized. So I always did something where I could either, I either had value inherent, for example, with a discount or I could add value in some way, for example, by refurbishment or changing the use, say from single let to HMO or things like that. So that became my strategy. You know, BRR was my killer strategy. You know, when I got started doing refurbishments, doing small, you know, um, developments, I wouldn't call them large developments, very, very small stuff and trying to add value and recycle money because I didn't have lots of it. When I first started, I had 10,000 pounds which was um, from a bonus at work. That's the personal funding I had available when I got going. So there we go, that's how I got started. Wow, that's, um, that's so interesting. So from that point, what strategies did you adapt as, and how did you scale up? Yeah, good questions. I mean quite a lot of different strategies in a way, to be honest with you, Helen. I don't necessarily advocate this for everyone else. Um, so if I tell you part of the reason why I pursued a number of different strategies, it was also to educate myself. Mm. So, so for example, I'll get into it in a second, but when I got into service accommodation, I did it because I wanted to educate myself about the strategy uh, more than anything. So you guessed it, I did a bit of service accommodation, but before that, I was doing mainly, I did a little bit of flips, which helped raise money for some of the BRR, buy, refurbish, refinance, where you, you, know, you add some value, you put a tenant in, you refinance it, and you pull some money out. Now, you, the, you know, a lot of the gurus or cer certain people in property would say you can fully recycle your money from a BRR strategy. I think it's, it, it, it was possible, but I don't think it's as possible now. It, it possibly is under the right conditions. But I think largely you expect to leave some money in the deal. And so you have to top up that fund. And you, you, you know, the basic ways to top it up are, you know, through your own personal you know, fundraising, savings, bonuses, and friends and family, or stuff like that. Or alternatively, if you flip along the way, you can, you know, hopefully generate a profit and some or all of that profit can stay in your next deal. So did a bit of flipping, did a bit of uh, buy refurbish refinance. Um, did a bit of service accommodation, started to get a bit more adventurous, did, it went up to HMOs, um, went for a bit of planning with HMOs to get the uh, sui generis um, st you know, status, if you like. Um, then I started to do a little bit of the same, but in different countries, just because. So I do actually have investment interests in four countries, including the UK. So UK, USA are the big two, and then also Portugal and Brazil. Uh, the latter two, because of the, particularly my wife is, is Brazilian, speaks Portuguese, so that, that's a big help. Um, probably wouldn't invest in those areas without, <laughs> without my wife, frankly. But the USA and the U UK, or apart from the USA, is like 50 countries. It's not actually one. It's crazy. But there we go. So diversity, diversified across geographies, uh, tenant types, single let, uh, mainly white, you know, working tenants, let's say. Um, and then the service departments, I think I'm getting most of them. But it was only recently, because you were saying about scaling, it was only recently in the last two, two and a half years or so, where I, I would say I really scaled up. And um, in that time, I've moved into conversions, you know, commercial conversions in particular, and some ground up development as well. And um, the, it's, it's interesting, you'll probably ask me what changed for me. I don't know, maybe you will, but... Um, so from a strategy's point of view, I kind of got to conversions and developments and I've, I've currently got something like uh, seven uh, projects on the go right now. 
um, that I'm working through at different stages of development. Well, you were right. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> Thanks for stealing my thunder. <laughs> So um, how and how's that gone? How's the scaling up gone? Um, I guess what you know. What are the what are the different things that you now need to consider? Yeah, well, thank. Um, there's a lot of different things, and how it's gone is mixed, frankly. Um, so I scale very fast. Um, th there is a lot of the, the two. Um, there's three big things you need. I think. I think the first one is you, is, is your own belief and your own mindset and you know sometimes there was a bit of a glass ceiling um in fact that occurred more than once in my career or my you know my business business life you hit this glass ceiling you just put a limit on your capabilities um and so one one lesson i perhaps would suggest to people there is you know i used to say things like i can't do that i can't do that and more you know recently i've been saying how can i do that instead of you know so just reframe the same you know, i don't know how to do it but rather than say i can't do it because i don't know i say how can i do it and then something magical happens when you reframe a negative i can't do a limiting belief into more of a you know what would be the opposite of a limiting belief unlimited Limit, belief. Yeah. limitless belief limitless belief thank you so if you reframe it as a limitless belief two things happen one is your own subconscious starts working on the problem because you posed it as a problem. And then the second thing is, and this is getting woo-woo, and I know sometimes we talk about woo-woo, but the universe it knows about it as well. And then suddenly things start to happen, which you think, how could that be? People start coming into your world that could answer that problem. So one is the mindset and the belief, and this breaking through the glass ceiling. But fundamentally, once you've got the belief, that's not it. You don't just stand there and wait for the universe to give you, you know, these great opportunities. So the next things are, um, you need you need the opportunities, and then you need the funds to you know undertake the opportunities. There, you, you can't do anything without those two things. And then after that, you need the team, and you need the skill set, and you need all of the good things, the professionals, if you like, to make it happen. And, and so when I said mixed, the I got pretty much so I broke through the glass ceiling. I was getting up, then I was getting opportunities. Then I was getting the funds to, you know, be able to take advantage of the opportunities, um, manifesting, whatever you want to say, but, you know, that was happening. And of course, what I knew at the levels I was working at was a certain level. And what I needed to know as I moved up in scale was, was different. Mm -hmm. And um, so stepping out, I stepped out, you know, quite big time. And we, Damien, who I was working with a while ago, as you know, Damien, mm -hmm. we had a phrase which was go big or go home. Yes, I remember. So we went big and then we went home. But um, <laughs> no, but um, so pushing out too too far too soon, you know, I think they call it overtrading, you know, can have a detrimental effect. So just be careful about that. So I think today, you know, now I've got like more professional team around me. I understand things a lot better. And you know things that are going to, you know, take longer, the more complicated and dealing with planning and things like that is much more complex. Um, having, you know, the, the principles of project management are the same and yet the, the level of detail is, is that much different. So there's lots of different elements to larger projects, but you grow into it. I just wish I'd have grown into it a little bit more leisurely than I did. So I've got my stripes, you know, from and on my battle scars from over the last few years through that growth but actually it's now put me in a really great place um, to to keep going and the just just i think it's important at this stage to say that growth is not for everyone um, and you know accelerated growth is not for everyone i, I think um, i'm on a bit of a mission because i've now got a goal to develop a legacy and the legacy is not for me or even my family uh, although don't get me wrong my family are very important to me and they will be well looked after it's actually beyond me and my family now so i'm on this mission and so that's part of the reason why i'm scaling and continuing to scale and push myself and push limits and boundaries so um yeah so that like i say it's not for everyone uh, because it depends what your personal goals are and what you're trying to achieve and it also depends on your resources and your risk profile lots of other factors too but you know 
I think I've given you a bit of a clue about my risk profile from some earlier experiences. So it suits me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I guess it's probably a good point to move on to what your biggest mistakes have been. I know you're, you're a very honest person and you will not hold back. What were those, you know, crazy aha moments along the way um, that you could share with uh, with your listeners yeah thanks helen for that yeah <laughs> <laughs> this this is the schadenfreude bit isn't it um so i mean i think not having the personal financial financial education from an earlier stage would be the first one because i was ignorant to that to a large extent i shouldn't have been but i was so I, I think getting educated, you know, on, in, with personal finance at an early stage is very, very important. And, you know, I'm 50 odd, I'm mid 50s now. So, you know, I've been full time, well, I've been working in property for the last 10 years, 11 years. And, you know, imagine if I'd have started when I was 21 or something, you know, it would have been a lot different. So that's the first thing that was, I could have been better equipped. The second thing probably is, you know, selling that property, I told you about when I started as an accidental landlord. That was in the mid '90s, so over 20 years ago. And you know, and if I'd have held on to it for a bit longer, I probably would have started sooner as well, and, and that would have, you know, created a snowball effect at an earlier point in life. Um, I think getting the education, um, I got the education, the financial education, uh, and then property education as well, but it took a long time. So I think that four year hiatus, you know, between my, what I call my Eureka moment and actually investing needn't have been four years. Now I'm not saying people should just leap and just, you know, you know just jump into the first thing they see, uh, sink or swim or try and, you know, crash courses and pay too much for education. I think uh, I have a strong view on that as well. You know, you should, you know, invest in yourself. Absolutely. But there's some things you can do, you know, relatively low cost, um, certainly to get a foundation. So do that. Um, so I, I took too long. And then I think probably I, let's say I perfected, maybe not perfected, but I, I, I got the cookie cutter working pretty well from say 2009 to until roughly 2017-18. Um, so I decided to scale, but not really scaling with the right um, tool and structure to uh, team and structure sorry what i meant to say with the right team and structure in place and probably grew, you know grew too fast without the right team around me and and so there were some growing pains <laughs> there were some growing pains at that you know during that during that phase so that that there are some of the key lessons i suppose there's probably more I, i've made loads of mistakes i think um I, I, one of the benefits perhaps of being an old dog who's made a load of mistakes is that you can impart some of that wisdom because I, 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 I say experience is learning from your own mistakes and wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. So um, I've got a bit of wisdom. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, do you know what we haven't asked? Well, I haven't asked you. What was the date or the, the year when you actually managed to go full time in property? I should know that. Um, <laughs> So I just, I'm really rubbish with dates. Um, so I was working for Siemens Financial Services at the time. And so I can probably peg it from my CV. So I think it was round about 2012, something, maybe something like that. And that first year was a, an interesting one because I stepped out without a, a full safety net. Um, again, a clue to my risk profile. But um, so I had, I put my hand up for a voluntary redundancy at work and they said, put your hand down. And I said, no, please, what's, what's the package? What's the package? And I, you, there's a box over here with your name on it. You know, you, you're okay, you know? So and I said, no, but, but really what's the package? But the last thing you should do in a redundancy situation is ask what the package is because you, you don't end up with the full, uh, benefits necessarily that you could do but it didn't matter to me because by then I had a few uh, vitalettes and um, HMOs I had an income stream I think it was about three grand a month something like that at the time 
And I thought, well, this is it. This is my moment. So that, that wasn't full income replacement. I was earning a six figure salary at the time, including all the bits and bobs that you get added onto it. And so I, I also realized I didn't need to earn that much money, um, you know, personally you know, with, with some, with some um, adaptation. So uh, I put my hand up for the redundancy and I kind of worked out with the money I had, you know, coming in and the money from the redundancy, I, I could, I had something like, I think it was um, six to nine months of runway, you know, to, to make a, a fist of it, if you like, in my first year. And uh, Helen, I missed uh, because it was, it, it was month 11 when I, I got the equivalent earnings to the previous year from full-time employment. So um, I had a two months, you know, below, you know, below the water before it kicked in, in in month 11. And that was mainly because I did a flip. So I did a flip to actually bridge the, the hole and it took a bit of time for that to happen. And then after that, you know, things being, being pretty good. The income's been there, it's grown steadily. I like to add assets to the portfolio, try and retain as much as possible. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, gone, it's gone really, really well. So I think stepping out was, as I say, you'd have to check my LinkedIn profile when I actually left <laughs> financial services for the exact date. But I think it was about then. So it would have been roughly um, somewhere three or four years into investing proper. Great. Okay, so the, the other side to your uh, now over, well over a decade um, of investing in property and around eight years of working full-time in property. <laughs> we'll check that on your LinkedIn profile later. Uh, so you, you must have plenty of tips and, and advice for either newbies to property investing or um, people who are just considering it at the moment and don't really know where to start. What would be your top tips at this juncture? For newbies in particular? Mm. Mm. Okay, so I always say, I mean, a lot of it depends on um, circumstances and your drivers and what you're trying to achieve. So I always say, you know, people, I tell you what, if someone, if someone gave me a pound, every time they said, you know, what strategy should I follow? I would be a very wealthy person. But you don't start with strategy, that's the point. So you start with what you want out of life. I always start there. So I say, what do you want out of life? What do you want your lifestyle to look like? What do you want to do with your time? Who do you want to you know, spend your time with? Um, you know, what's important to you? What values do you have? And these are sometimes tough questions, and especially if you're like 18 years old or something, you don't necessarily know all of those answers at that point. But Generally speaking, what do you want to, you know, and if you can't think about your whole life because you are only 18, 21, 25, 30, and you've got a lot, a lot of uh, decades ahead of you, then maybe you don't have all the answers, but you could say, well, what does it look like in, say, 10 years? So you can project for a, a shorter period of time. So I'd start there, um, which would be, you know, what do you want your future to look like? And then you can kind of work back from there. And you say, well, what is it, where, am I, where am I now? You kind of get this, what I call this gap analysis so you go, well, that's what I want it to look like. That's where I am now. Could be measured monetarily, could be, you know, your lifestyle, it could be your asset base, it could be things and causes you want to support in life, um, you know, that you, you want to achieve. And so you have this sort of gap. So I was talking about one of, the, one of the biggest tips is to plug your gaps. Well, one of them is to get from A to B, you know, that's a gap. But other gaps are, well, you might not have the funding, you might not have the know-how, you might not have the time um, to, or, or all of them, or some of them. And so plugging your gaps is um, you know, paramount. So once you've identified where you're going, what are the gaps that you actually have? And then it's really to set out, set out a plan of how you're gonna you know, plug those gaps, bridge that A to B gap as well, uh, and achieve what you, you want to achieve. So that's, so that's just the kind of business speak, you know, get, get your goals in place and get a plan in place, and, what resources do you need and how could you get them? But then I think there's the other side of it, which is much more about um, your mindset and your um, way of thinking. Um, so there's, there's two types of the mindset. There's like the knowledge part and then there's the kind of belief part. And either one can trip you up if you don't have, have it right. So I think I'd really major in on that. And so 
Um, I'm very much into personal development. I'm very much into what I call the principle of lifelong learning. Uh, even this old dog, you know, I just, I love to, um, you know, find out new things. My kids teach me things. I love it that they do. You know, I went pescatarian at the start of this year and that's largely influenced from my children. They're all grown up and activists, you know, in terms of saving the planet and everything, which is great. You know, and that teaches me, so it keeps me young as well. But I think get the knowledge. So with, with someone really starting out, particularly if they're at the younger end of the scale, I would say a couple of things. One is, you know, tune into some decent podcasts, um, go into some, you know, read some magazines, get a couple of books in the property space and get yourself sort of a core level of education, knowledge. And I'd spend about three to six months doing that. I would normally say network as well. Um, right now that's kind of difficult uh, physically at least so uh, you can virtually network um, and hopefully when things open up you can physically network as well uh, leave your credit card at home for that period of time and just get this foundational knowledge and just go out and explore without an agenda without needing or having uh, feeling a pressure to do anything because um, it's amazing because when you feel you've got money burning a hole in your pocket or you've got time you know, just slipping through the, you know, the sundial. Um, is that the word? It's not a sundial, is it? Um, the thing, the sand in it. The hourglass. That's it, the hourglass. <laughs> through the hourglass. Um, you know, it's not, as, it's not as pressurized as you think. So take your time. So get yourself educated. You don't necessarily need to spend tens of thousands of pounds on a property mentorship or anything like that. Um, and I think the other thing is, from a personal development point of view, is about belief. And this, when I say about belief, uh, um, well, mindset, actually, there's many different components. But I think, you know, the limiting beliefs and, and, and having a kind of a can-do attitude, being solution-minded, uh, being pragmatic. A bit of hard work is probably going to help you out as well, by the way, you know, to begin with. Um, certainly, you have to work hard initially to not, not work so hard later. So that's definitely a principle. So there's a few things there for the newbies in particular. And I've got a load, load of resources, as you, I'm sure you know, Helen, that people can plug into, which are either free or low cost. I think my, my book, uh, Property Investor Talk, it's only three quid or something. So you could, you know, in a, a magazine subscription. You know, actually, my articles on YPN are free, a subscription free. Just need to um, write in to, to us and uh, ask to be put on that mailing list. You get all those. So I do that to begin with. But I really work on mindset and belief because, and here's the thing. Um, did we talked about this before. Did we talk about the one percent, the one percent club? Did we talk about that? I think I've certainly heard a mention of it before. So, but yeah, let's. We we haven't talked about it in this in this episode. So let's run through that again. So, to be in the one percent in the UK, um, on average, there's two two measures of of. Um, of the 1% I'm referring to here. One is by income and one is by wealth or net assets. So do you have, have an idea of what sort of income level or asset value you might need in either case to be in the top 1% of the population, approximately? I can't remember. So you'll have to refresh my memory. So it's 160,000 a year. And it's, it's, I think it's 3.2 million. I think it's 3.2 million um, net assets. And so, uh, that's, that's to be in the 1% club. And that's just by wealth. And by the way, when I talk about 1% club, it's not only by wealth, it's also about the way, way you think and it doesn't always have to be financial. So it's just a way of thinking. It's, it's, a, it's a, a way of being almost um, as, well, as much as anything. But if you want to be in the 1% or if you um, want to have that kind of mindset, then you actually have to think like a 1%er, as I call it. Uh, I, ideally, you need to associate with 1%ers. And, you know, be, you know, they say, you know, we're a product of the four or well, five or six people closest to us. Uh, whether that's scientifically proven, I don't know, but there's a lot of merit in, we, we're influenced by our environment. We're in, influenced by people around us. So I think, you know, surround yourself with the right type of people. Get as much positive input, you know, positive energy. People who've actually done it as well, I would say that, because there's lots of so-called experts who haven't really done it. So just make sure you find the right people to associate with. And that can be just people who are committed to personal growth. That's what I mean about 1% from that point of view. So it could be someone who's not 
you know, financially in the 1%, but has the sort of mindset and attitude and commitment level of being in the 1%. And I think this, you know, our, our own mindset and the environment or the people that we associate with are the two biggest drivers, actually. Um, for and, and this doesn't just apply to young people, it applies to all of us, um, you know, to get that right. So put yourself in the right environment, associate with the right people, flip that lid off your head and put some good stuff inside that brain, um, you know, from, from reading good books and it isn't just books these days, there's all sorts of media and content that you can learn from. Uh, invest in yourself. And certainly leave the credit card at home for a while. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we are talking in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic and um, I know it as an aspiring investor myself, I wonder what changes we might see in in the property market, um, both you know now and after hopefully the pandemic passes. What would you say to people who who might be worrying about whether now is a good time to invest, and what potential changes there might be in the marketplace? Sure. Okay. So as far as potential changes in the marketplace, who knows? <laughs> that wasn't the answer you're looking for, though, was it? well i guess it's more like what you know what is there anything that we can do as do. i'm just playing i'm just playing with you, <laughs> I'm playing with you. so um i have i have my own thing i mean i meant who knows in a, in a i was a being a bit ironic but i you know i have my own opinion about what might happen but i might be proven wrong um so for example i do think that w there will be opportunity i think commercial and retail will be decimated um, but probably on like a staircase type of um, model because there's so much, you know, government support that's being put into business, let's say, and individuals. There's the job furlough scheme. There's the, uh, I forgot what they are. There's the, the grants for the hospitality sector. There's the bounce back loans and civils loans. You know, there's a whole range of different, you know, unprecedented level, actually, of financial aid and not just going into the large banks and everything, which is what happened primarily in the global financial crisis, um, roughly when I started investing. Um, this is going into the hands of small businesses and, and, and larger businesses and individuals. Um, but it will be, we will be weaned off it. And as we're weaned off it, there will be, unfortunately, winners and losers. Um, but I think some of the losers might be more in the commercial retail hospitality sector. So I see an opportunity from a, a, a maybe a horrible thing to say, but I think you know change of use from commercial and retail into residential could be an area for a, 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 an aspiring investor to look at over the next months or years. I think residential will probably largely bear up, um, if you know if not thrive to some extent. I think there might be a blip. There might be some unemployment, and that might affect things. But you know even with unemployment, that creates opportunities for investors with say you know, benefits tenants even. So I think you can hedge a little bit there. So I think residential will bear up a bit stronger than say the commercial sector. So that's the kind of looking forward bit. I'm probably seeing some, maybe some changes in trends like homeworking, look at you and I, we're, we're both, you know, from our homes having this call over Zoom, I like thousands of people um, at the moment. And, you know, my wife works in HR, as I've probably told you before. And she's been doing lots of surveys. She, she's responsible for 55,000 people. And um, they're largely really enjoying working from home. They, there's lots of merit in it and people kind of want to stay with it as far as possible. There's some challenges with that. Childcare and, you know, being on your own and not having the right equipment and working, working at the kitchen, you know, table with the kids screaming around you and stuff like that. It's not always ideal. Um, but I think there'll be homeworking, different trends like that. And there'll be some downsizing of large offices and maybe a bit more of a push towards regional bases, which, by the way, will mean people might move out of cities and look for green space, outside space, you know, maybe even work from a laptop in Bali. Who knows? So I think there's some going to be some trends like that. So the question I will say is, well, so what? So with these changes, so what? And as an intelligent investor, that's the question you're always asking. So what? What does that mean to me? What can I do with that information? So I think that is, I'm not necessarily going to give all the answers, but I think ask the question, so what? And what do you make of it yourself? But the, the first question you asked me was, um, oh yeah, change because of the um, pandemic, et cetera. So 
Here's the thing, the last time we had anything of this scale was before pretty much anybody's lifetime or certainly living memory, Spanish flu roughly ran about the First World War was the closest parallel we've got. We've had other localized pandemics um, and we've had some global pandemics, but on a smaller scale. But on this sort of level, you know, in terms of scale and, and, and reach, um, it was the Spanish flu is the last thing. And no one can remember what happened then, um, pretty much. Because even if you are 100 years old, the roundabout winners, you wouldn't remember what happened. So, um, so we, we can learn from back then. I have done some research and there was like a relatively you know, sharp drop. And then I'm doing more of a tick these days. I think it's going to be more of a tick recovery rather than a V recovery. Mm. So I think there will be a, a, a there is a short, short, sharp shock, but it will recover perhaps not as long. It won't take necessarily as long to recover as a global financial crisis, maybe. But um, so that's my just prediction. Um, but here's the thing, whether it's a pandemic or a global financial crisis or an oil crisis or a ERM, you know, um, exchange rate mechanism, you know, collapse or any other crisis that you might want to mention, just ordinary recession, change happens, cycle, we go through cycles. Mm -hmm. So um, whether it's an economic cycle or property cycle, something will happen and everyone will go, well, I didn't see that coming, but guess what? We go through those cycles and roughly at least once a decade, we'll see something happen of a significant scale. So the thing with being a property investor um, in particular, you know, and developer is being able to survive these um, shocks and prepare ourselves for them. So I always talk about making our property portfolio bulletproof um, to a recession. So there's various ways you can do that. I probably don't have time for it in this discussion, but if anybody's interested, I've got some resources around that. So we should, we should prepare ourselves in what we do so that we can you know survive some of the hard times and they will come and they will come but by the way out of hard times also comes opportunity so you know you want to you want to take the opportunities when they arise and you want to protect the downside you know in the good times so that you can survive the downside when it comes around full circle again so whether it's a pandemic global financial crisis or any other you know apparent shock to the economy or the property market expect it it's going to happen and be prepared be prepared in a positive way, but also be prepared in a defensive way, is what I would say. That's um, fascinating to hear you say that, Richard. So I, I know quite a few people who are very successful in property uh, now. And something that really strikes me about all of them is they don't see these kind of global crises as too much of an issue they well they what they don't exhibit is fear they seem to they look for the opportunities that that's how they see a challenge is okay so where's the opportunity um and also you know diversifying your whether it's your property portfolio or whether it's a wider investment portfolio makes total sense so you know what i think we're coming to the end of our interview today um is there anything else that um, i should have asked you that i haven't asked you mm. um. certainly where can people um access well, information it might be a good i do that but i'm just thinking if there's something i really feel i should say and um it's kind of a reinforcement in some some respects of something I did say earlier, but I think, you know, know, know yourself, um, know what you stand for, what your values and principles are and um, be, be an oak tree, put, put firm roots down. So when a storm comes along and this is a metaphor you can use for yourself and your own character and your personality, but also for your business, your property business. So I want to just leave maybe with that parting thought of an oak tree that um, it's very rare you'll see an oak tree that's blown over by a gale because they, you know, and they, they, they stand for, you know, a century or more. So I, I would say that's probably the biggest principle of all. And so, but know yourself um, and then really try and associate with, this is the most important thing. There's so many partnerships and opportunities to develop and learn and collaborate in this industry sector. But I would try and work with people you really resonate with. And the way to really understand that is first understand yourself. 
Um, so really get in touch with yourself, your values, uh, because there's going to be plenty of opportunities, plenty of collaborations that come your way and plenty of opportunities to um, take people's services, actually. But, you know, try and work with people who resonate with you guys. So that's probably the bit I wanted to stress more than anything. Sorry to go on a bit more, longer, but I think... <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> this is the Property Voice podcast uh, interviewing the what would otherwise be the host. Uh, you probably know where to find a lot of stuff. So, um, you know, obviously our website, um, thepropertyvoice.net. And I think um, if you want any of the resources I've been referring to on and off throughout, you know, the recession proofing or the YPN subscription or things like that, just drop an email admin at thepropertyvoice.net. And uh, Karen, a delightful Karen who helps me, um, has been for a number of years now. We'll gladly point you in the right direction. And of course, reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to give people a pointer. Um, you know, and, and that might be to a resource I already have, but or it might be to a person if it's not not me. But you know, just reach out. So that's probably the, go to the website propertyvoice.net and maybe the email. And normally, say if you want to reach me personally, it's podcast at propertyvoice.net. So, but if you want the resources, admin. If you want me, podcast. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for uh, allowing yourself to be submitted to uh, my interview questions. And I'm absolutely certain that um, your listeners will have got so much from, from this. So thanks again. No, thank you, Helen. But actually, before we go, um, I think it's important um, because this is, we talk about values. And I know you share a lot of these values yourself, but you've got some exciting news yourself, haven't you? Looming, I believe. Yes, I have. So um, I'm just about to launch a joint venture. Um, I'm a book coach, business book coach, and uh, I've joined forces with a business friend who's, you know, we share the same values. That's how it, this all came about. She <laughs> is a layout designer. <laughs> And uh, it was actually my suggestion when we realised that we were both being asked regularly by clients about the other parts of the book, um, you know, publishing process. Um, and, and I suggested that we might want to come together and offer a complete solution for self-publishing a business book from concept to completion. So it's called the Biz Book Foundry. Uh, it's www.bizbookfoundry.com and um, yeah, delighted to uh, have a chat about people's book ideas uh, if they'd like to get in touch. Yeah, I've seen you. You're so um, prolific, actually, at the moment, um, both in delivery and also communicating your message on, on some of the social media platforms. And you deliver an awful lot of valuable content just in, in that area. I know you do a couple of challenges. I don't know if you're still doing those from time to time where you give give over content i've attended one myself so it was good um <laughs> I can speak with experience so um i wish you all the best for that helen you definitely deserve it um you. you i mean i've known you now for a few years we've worked together in a number of different ways including with some of the book stuff so um if anybody is interested in um because by the way just to put it in context um a book is like a giant business card isn't it it's you know this authority that you can have um, in your sector or in your niche so if you want a giant business card probably not the best analogy either but if, if you want a higher profile a bigger profile then maybe get in touch with Helen and Catherine with the BizBook Foundry I'm sure they'll help you out good luck with it thank you very much welcome are we done okay, okay. bye, bye. <laughs>